There is no shortage of post-apocalyptic stories out there to consume before the actual apocalypse takes place, and even then you'll be a skeleton patiently waiting for someone to finally make a third 28 Days Later film. Seriously, can someone please make this happen? Anyway, to kneel down one definitive story that confidently summarizes the broad symbolism of this particular subgenre isn't really all that hard. All you have to do is go back to the very inspiration behind the ultimate zombie classic that practically pioneered everything you need to know about apocalyptic storytelling, George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead is a juggernaut when it comes to the horror genre, not just because it coined the mainstream definition of a zombie, but because it encouraged this pure deviance when it came to subject matter. I've already covered the taboo nature of Living Dead's cultural and historical subversion surrounding race and politics in a previous video, yet what got under people's skin in a broader sense was how it encompassed this underlying fear of the world just seemingly falling apart and turning violent on itself. Despite being far from a new idea, it brought a certain domestic intimacy that was rarely seen in other Cold War inspired horrors out there. While creature features of the era used exaggerated symbolism, Living Dead was more nuanced in its provocative nature, showing that the monsters outside aren't really as much of a threat as the monsters inside. That is, humans being inherently selfish creatures can so easily resort to violence and desperate means to protect themselves that unravels everything we take for granted about civilized humanity, blah 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 blah. Of course, as you saw in my videos on previous exploitation films like The Hills Have Eyes, 70s horror was co-defined by this very discourse surrounding what civilization really meant and how war, conflict and social unrest brought us closer to self-annihilation than we fear to realize. Now, getting back on topic, Night of the Living Dead's inspiration was one of the first popular mainstream takes on what has now become the tired, almost comedically overused cliché of man is the real monster. This was Richard Matheson's 1954 science fiction horror I Am Legend, the story of the last man on earth Robert Neville trying to research and develop a cure to a vampiric pandemic that wipes out all of mankind as he tries to survive through the dangers of both the outside world and the loneliness and isolation that plagues his mind. You see what I mean by cliché. So let's talk about it. Look, I know I Am Legend isn't anything masterful or groundbreaking. I could point you to Cormac McCarthy's The Road as a better example of post-apocalyptic storytelling, except I'd rather leave that misery for another time. But you could argue I Am Legend partially revolutionized what is now the cliche of questioning who the monster really is. For such a remarkably bleak setup about a man isolated in a world simply out to kill him, living each day with increasing psychological collapse, the story does end on an appropriately, if surprisingly bittersweet note. The thing is, Robert Neville is established as the tried and true archetypical everyday American hero, just some relatable ordinary guy who selflessly risks his life to create hope for humanity. It's that storytelling messiah complex that it's his duty and destiny to save us all from damnation. In modern times, obviously many stories deviate greatly from such a complex because it's now seen as generic, yet for 1954 it was rarer that the hero's status was then called into question. There are many angles in which you can empathize with Neville, from his grief to his anger to his depression to his struggles and fears of survival, he's your conventional audience-friendly character. But the conclusion makes him and the audience face the fact that his circumstances are self-perpetuated. That is, Neville comes to the realization, yet never fully accepts, that he is indirectly the villain of the story. As the sympathetic audience, we naturally side on the perspective that he is justified in his actions of going around hunting vampires and experimenting on them because he is trying to save the world after all. Surely that's a good thing, right? Well... It comes back to cynicism later fiction soon began to cultivate, in which real world war, conflict and divide made us question how much of our morality is a fabrication to make us feel like the good guys, when really we've nearly destroyed each other on multiple occasions, in fact we still are. 
In the case of I Am Legend, we discover that the vampires Neville is killing are just as functional as humans and share an equal hatred and fear towards Neville as he has for them. In their eyes, he's the monster attacking them in the same way he sees them as the monsters attacking him. Both sides are on equal standing, and what takes it a step further is how the story uses the conventions of the fantasy fiction template that humans are good and monsters are bad and completely subverts it in such a way that while, narratively speaking, Neville is the hero of his own story, in the context to what the world has become, he fits closer to the premise of the monster. Essentially, the title of the story, I Am Legend, is rooted in this one idea. Robert Neville is the boogeyman. The Bubba Yaga, the monster that hides under your bed, the creature that lurks in the shadows, insert whatever other urban myth you want to compare him to. Basically, he's the true threat to this world because, well, it's not his world anymore. If you become the last of your kind, if the world literally turned against your species and left you on the brink of extinction, can you really blame it for maintaining the natural order? That is, the survival of the fittest. By legend, Neville has made a name for himself, not as a saviour like all the other heroes that he can be compared to, but as the last monster of his kind. Almost like an historical footnote in the negative side of history, that is, a history of war, conflict, and the constant fear generated by a power race. I Am Legend takes on an allegorical approach to its story given the book emerged a decade after the Second World War and during the height of the nuclear arms race, but from a broader perspective, I Am Legend projects the notion that the world doesn't belong to us in the first place. It belongs to whatever dominates and cultivates it at the time before something stronger and superior comes along and takes its place. As we watch Neville constantly strive to save the world, what we don't consider is that he's effectively fighting a worthless cause. He's the one going around hunting creatures and experimenting on them, needlessly wasting lives in the process to save a species that doesn't need saving or at least can't really be saved. The significant point is this, humanity isn't gone, it just changed. Changed in such a way that the problem for him is that he doesn't want to be a part of what it's become. He's conservative on the idea that he's not the one who needs to adapt. His behaviour is pretty much contextually selfish and ignorant. The generation he represents is no longer the dominant species. In a way, he doesn't really have any bargaining power. In his eyes, a radically new species has infiltrated and infected the seemingly outdated one, so that gives him a lot less leeway in how to approach the situation, which can also be used as a template to reflect many social and political changes in America at the time, but it's up to you how you wish to interpret it. That said, while the general theme is Neville refusing to conform to change, the story is never as directly black and white about condemning him as wrong, given his actions still mirror that of the creatures. It's never preachy about it, and Neville's resistance is justified in his paranoia and isolation over several years of being alone, that he simply can't comprehend what he perceives as a natural enemy having the same ideals as him to rebuild civilization by wiping out the feral creatures. I mean, they both want the same thing, but Neville being totally consumed by the same unchanged attitude and beliefs can't accept the creatures as anything like him. They are always going to be monsters to him, and they will always feel the same way about him as well, leading to Neville choosing to take his own life rather than let this new civilization take it from him. He goes out on his own terms, maintaining everything he believed in from the beginning, unchanged by the challenge of this new way of life, culture, society, or whatever you wish to define it as, who at the same time equally refused to acknowledge or understand his fears in the process as well. Matheson's approach to the story isn't about good versus evil or distinguishing right from wrong. It shows how civilization in any shape or form effectively can't be in total peace. There will always be conflict, divide, and war. It's somewhat a contradiction to the morals the civilized creatures proclaim. If Neville is a representation of death and destruction to them, they're ultimately using the same methods against him too, and vice versa in the way he sees them as the representation of death and destruction. 
Now, before we finish, I know this video has talked exclusively about the book, so let's take a second to address the three core film adaptations, The Last Man on Earth, Omega Man, and Will Smith Kills a Dog. While respectively good films in their own right, they do largely miss the point of the story and just rest on the general outline of the book. Last Man on Earth is technically the most faithful, but never profoundly relates to real-world conflict to avoid becoming a controversial film. Omega Man just falls back into the messiah complex where Neville literally becomes a saviour because his blood is the cure, and the Will Smith version actually does have a poignant outcome, but studio interference made them overthrow it. In the 2007 version, Neville sacrifices himself to kill the creatures so the cure can be passed on, you know, basic Hollywood stuff. But in the director's cut, it's revealed the alpha male chasing him was looking to get back his lost love, who Neville was experimenting on, symbolised by a butterfly that appears as a recurring motif to the story. In that conclusion, Neville gives back the girl, takes the cure, realises his own monstrous ways, and leaves the city, ending the film with, I guess, a healthy compromise where both parties decide to keep their distance from each other, adding a less cynical touch to Matheson's original idea. Regardless, the point still stands that I Am Legend was a scrutiny to this traditional world-saving hero's journey. What exactly is Neville looking to accomplish when nature pretty much speaks for itself? The overarching conflict of the story is one that's created by humans. In the book, it's mostly summarised to be a direct result of war, so in effect, here we have a man trying to save a world that did this to itself. Humanity is the causation. It paints the world as unfairly controlled by forces who seek power and dominance, only to lead to downfall. I Am Legend is about the vicious cycle of conflict that is represented through Neville. It's never-ending, and there's no resolution when self-preservation overrides any willingness to share our territory with others, both figuratively and literally. It's not saying we're evil for not being open, it understands our anxieties about the outsider, yet in a day and age when the loudest people out there want to force their morals and self-proclaimed good nature onto others to make themselves feel better, it's helpful to be reminded by the occasional cynic that, at the end of the day, we're all really just a bunch of bastards in disguise. Hey folks, thank you so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts on I Am Legend in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this episode and you enjoy what I do here and you want to support the channel and help me to sustain it and grow it with the whole uh, crazy way the internet is these days with uh, censoring everything and demonetizing stuff, uh, please consider heading over to Patreon where for just a few dollars a month, not only will you get early access, you'll get to vote on future videos, you'll get your name in the credits, and most importantly, access on our exclusive Discord community where you can tell me what you've been watching, playing, reading, uh, what you're working on, uh, share your work. That's awesome. We love seeing that. Uh, it's a very positive, friendly, inviting community. We hope to see you over there. And until next time, uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Stay very, very safe, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.